Morning. Another day, another real world test. Today, we're doing it on the Microsoft Surface Laptop Studio. Lots of words there, but for good reason. But if you're not familiar, I'm gonna use this laptop as my normal laptop. We'll go throughout my day. I'll test a bunch of things on it. We'll talk about some of the features I like and don't like, and we'll do that while we also go and explore a bit. But first things first. <laughs> And this is a new restaurant that opened right next to my filming studio. And even though they just opened for dinner inside, which looks beautiful, by the way, and I wanna try, they've had this window, which they serve coffee out of, which is great, and their breakfast burrito. I don't know why it's so good. And the name of the place is Serenico. And as far as I can tell, it's actually a word that means calm, but in a language called Esperanto, which apparently is the most widely used artificially constructed language in the world. And by that I mean it's a language that was created for people who speak two different languages to use to then be able to communicate with each other. I didn't even know that was a thing. And while we're here, let's talk about the design of this laptop. Firstly, it's made from magnesium and it feels pretty solid. So I feel like everybody looking at this laptop online and photos was like, that's a chunky laptop. And it is gonna be larger than other 14 inch laptops for the most part, like this Razer Blade 14 that I've been using lately. But it has a slightly larger 14.4 inch display. And the bigger thing is it's a three by two aspect ratio, which means that thanks to Pythagorean theorem, it'll never fit in the same footprint, even if it had a 14 inch screen. So a better way to get an idea of the size is to compare it to other three by two aspect ratio laptops. Now, unfortunately there aren't a lot of them, but I do have this Realme book that I just did a video on not too long ago that is a three by two aspect ratio laptop that was just released in Europe and India. And putting them side by side, it's not actually that much bigger. Remember, this is a 14 inch laptop versus the Surface 14.4 inches. Now you're familiar with its siblings in the Surface line. Microsoft has been using three by two aspect ratio pretty much exclusively on those ever since like the first few generations went by. So putting it next to the Surface Laptop 4 15 inch and then the Surface Laptop Book 3 15 inch, it's actually only a bit thicker than the laptop, but still smaller volume wise and actually feels a lot smaller than the Book 3. And of course, has a 0.6 inch smaller screen than both and smaller bezels. It's also 3.83 pounds for the i5 model and four pounds for the i7 model that I have here. So 0.2 pounds less than the book and 0.6 pounds more than the laptop for 15 inch and only 0.08 more than my smaller Razer Blade 14. So for me, it feels good size wise. And having come from a Razer Blade 14, as I mentioned, I'm starting to feel like the 14 inch ish size is a really good balance between portability and functionality. So long as you have enough resolution on the screen so that things aren't huge and you have a lot more real estate on the 14 inch screen. And I think part of the reason this device looks a bit bulky is because of its like rectangle on top of a rectangle design. And what I mean by that is that the edges of the device actually stick out from the base of it. And you can see the vents here for the intake and exhaust of the cooling system, as well as for the subwoofers for the speakers, which we'll get to later. Personally, I really like the look. It kind of makes the laptop look very distinct. And there's another use for this design, actually. The front lip can now house and charge the new Surface Slim Pen 2, and it uses a very strong magnet to do so. Taking it in and out of my backpack never causes it to fall off, unlike the Surface Book 3, because it was attached to the side. Every time I would take that out of my bag, I would just find the pen at the bottom of the bag. And I think the more secure placement of the pen helps a lot with something that myself and other tech reviewers always say about styluses when it comes to devices. They need a place to be put on the device or you'll forget it or just not think to bring it. And when that moment happens where you need to use it, it won't be there. Now this solves for that and we'll discuss how the pen works a bit later. But also, I have to say, it's very satisfying to slide the pen under the lip and hear a very solid snap and it's gone. And this is the Greenpoint Terminal Market. It's kind of like a little flea market. There's like handmade goods and thrift shopping, a couple of food vendors. It's not very busy today. It's usually a summer thing. It's a lot more busy then, but there's a few people here. And it's situated on a, at least up till recently, unused plot of land right here on the East River with views of Manhattan skyline 
right behind us. It's actually kind of cool to use this same area at night to turn it into a, like, they call it a drive-in, walk-in, bike-in movie theater. I don't know, it's not a bad place to do a little shopping, eat some food, and maybe watch a movie. While we're here, though, let's talk about the display on this laptop. For that display, we have a 3 by 2 aspect ratio, as mentioned, 14.4 inch, 2400 by 1600 resolution, pixel sense flow touchscreen, as Microsoft calls it. The flow part of that moniker is new and it's used to denote the fact that this screen has a 120 hertz refresh rate. Now, if you're unfamiliar, 120 hertz means that the screen will refresh what is on the display 120 times a second. This means that movement in the form of gaming, scrolling, even OS animations, etc., appear a lot smoother than the usual 60 hertz displays of most laptops out there. And it does make Windows feel smoother in the same way that I've said in the past how it makes Android phones with high refresh rates feel smoother, and now iOS phones with the new iPhone 13 Pro and Pro Max also having 120 hertz displays. And it's one of those things that is kind of subtle, but when you go to it and then go back to a display that has a lower refresh rate, you do notice it. Now the downside generally to these high refresh rates is that while the screen needs to refresh things twice as much in the case of 60 hertz versus 120, and that means that it's gonna consume a bit more power. Now regardless, I used the laptop for writing and research and surfing the web for about 30 minutes with the screen on 120 hertz, and I lost 6%. I then went into settings and manually turned the screen down to 60 hertz, did the same thing, and lost 6% again. And actually a recent video I did with the Razer Blade 14 that I've mentioned, and it has a 165 hertz screen. I did the same thing, 165 to 60, and I got the same results. It didn't make any difference in the battery usage, at least while doing normal activities. And so I'm gonna leave it on 120, because I like it, and it doesn't seem to matter. As for brightness, Microsoft says it has 500 nits of peak brightness. Using it here, in the sunlight, uh, I can see it for the most part, except in like very direct sunlight. So it's good enough for me. It also happens to support Dolby Vision, which is a standard for color and brightness and contrast, but you'll only ever see that if you're watching a Dolby Vision enabled piece of content, which you can find on say, Netflix, for example. Now this device is a touchscreen, as I mentioned, but it's piece de resistance is the fact that there's a hinge in that screen that's pretty well hidden that allows you to move the screen into a few different placements. Speaking of, let's head to my studio so we can test that and the performance out of it. Kind of funny story. See that Super Mario like mystery box that's not quite done? Well, the graffiti artist that started to do that did it recently and then basically all of the police showed up <laughs> and got him stuck up there and kind of waited for him to essentially get hungry enough to come back down. He almost finished though. I don't know what they're filming with the drone, but I am here for it. Interesting. <laughs> Again, I'm here for this. And this is where the Microsoft Surface Laptop Studio gets the studio in its name from. This is the Microsoft Surface Studio 2. This model launched about three years ago in 2018 in October, whereas the original version launched in 2016. And honestly, I loved this computer. It was just so unique and honestly, a pretty impressive engineering feat. Microsoft took some of that engineering in the hinge and the design and put it in the laptop studio. Now to be clear, this isn't the first laptop that's tried to emulate that design. I did a video on Acer's Concept D9 laptop that did something similar back in March of 2020, but the big difference here is the hinge mechanism, something that Microsoft has just gotten very good at. The Acer used these giant hinges on the outside of the screen, which made it not fit into any bag, basically, and just made the laptop massive. This, by comparison, does a fantastic job of hiding the hinge to the point where if it wasn't for the one line on the back of the laptop, you wouldn't know it was there at all. And that's great, frankly. And this means to me that you can use the laptop like any other laptop, but you have the added benefit of those extra positions without any of the downsides. Now in the presentation about the laptop, Microsoft said that it was very inspired by not just the Surface Studio, but also the Surface Book. But to me, that kind of felt like them saying it was going to replace it. 
And I actually reached out to Microsoft and they did confirm to me that it will quote, be assuming the place previously occupied by Surface Book, end quote. And that makes a lot of sense to me as I myself never really detached the top part of the Surface Book. I always just kind of used it together because when you did detach it, you lost the GPU because that was in the base. So you lost some performance. You lost a decent chunk of battery because there was one in the base and one in the screen. And overall, it just made for a much more, as I've shown you, bulky form factor. This, however, is a form factor that I didn't know I wanted, but I've already kind of figured out how it fits into my professional workflow. Let me show you. Firstly, there are three modes. The first one being laptop mode, obviously. Then we have stage mode, as Microsoft calls it. And that kind of is where you pull the screen over the keyboard and there's a magnet just above the trackpad that locks it there. This is meant for like videos, maybe gaming. And then lastly, we have studio mode, which is where you bend the screen all the way to almost flat. And this is kind of where you're gonna use it when you're using the pen. There's also an unintended mode that I kind of figured out, but I don't think anyone will use, but you can actually flip the screen in laptop mode all the way to the back and windows will auto rotate and you can use it to show somebody something quickly maybe. I won't use it, but maybe one of you will. Now I'll show you the way that I found this form factor helpful for my workflow. Uh, let's also test the performance for photo editing, obviously. So I've loaded a photo from my Sony a7S III that I then touched up a little bit in Lightroom, but now I've brought it into Photoshop. And here's where that studio mode kind of becomes helpful for me because I can pinch to zoom to get close in on one of the phones, for example, and then using the pen, select the pen tool, and I can start to outline the screen of the phone. And I can go to paths and select that path I just did and turn into a selection by clicking that button. And now I'm going to edit and hit clear to delete out that screen on that phone. And then I just repeated that process till I ended up with all of the screens missing and went in and added a bunch of graphics to get the thumbnail that I wanted to kind of convey the idea that different versions of 5G result in very different speeds. I'll leave a link below if you're curious about that. But all that was made a lot easier, honestly, by using this pen instead of having to carry around a Wacom tablet like a lot of designers use, and also definitely better than like writing on a vertical screen with the pen. Now I'm using the Surface Slim Pen 2, by the way, which is not included with the laptop and costs an extra $129. Something I thought was clever about the new model is the fact that there's a haptic motor built into the pen that kind of, as you're drawing, gives you these small vibrations to try to make it feel like you're using it on something rougher than glass, a la real paper. Now you can adjust this in the settings to be less or more. I personally turned it all the way up, as even with that, it's still pretty subtle but I can feel it more, which I like. And the pen is also as accurate as I feel like the past pens have been, and maybe even has a little bit lower latency. This is apparently because of a new digitizer in all of the Surface lineup that was just announced screens. So Microsoft says that this is the most powerful Surface they've ever made. And a quick look at the specs does confirm that. Inside the laptop, we have the choice of an Intel 11th Gen i5 H35 or an 11th Gen i7 H35. The H in that, by the way, is their high performance line, in case you didn't know. And that can be paired with either 16 or 32 gigs of RAM and either a 256 or 512 gig SSD for the i5 or a 512 gig one or two terabyte SSD for the i7. For GPU, we have an Intel XE integrated GPU for the i5 and an NVIDIA RTX 3050 Ti discrete or dedicated GPU for the i7. But I am curious how it'll handle my video editing workflow. So I have loaded up a previous project that I was working on since the iPhone 13 Pro real world test, but it's all done. I've just loaded it up on the computer. We are unplugged and I just wanna see if it can play it back because this is 4K 10 bit footage from my Sony a7S III mixed in with obviously iPhone footage and also what usually most computers struggle on. There's a couple of scenes where I put four different photos up on the screen, all with text. And generally when a, a computer gets to that part in the video, it starts to lag. So first let's just see if it can play my 4K footage back in this 4K timeline with proxy mode turned off, which means that it's playing back at actually 4K. Couple of judders 
here and there, but it's okay, I would say. It's not bad. So now, let's play back that same section, but we're gonna turn on timeline proxy mode to half. And, okay, that's pretty smooth actually. All right, now I wanna try the hardest part of the video, like I mentioned, right before all of those photos, and I'm gonna put it back. I know this is not gonna work because it didn't work for just the normal footage, but we're gonna put it back to off. So now it's a 4K timeline, 4K footage, playing back in 4K. Eh. Little lag there. Let's see with the next shot. And a little lag there too. Okay, kind of what I expected after the beginning there. Let's change it to half. Okay. Let's see the next shot. Boom. Okay, cool, that works. So on half, it's able to essentially play back the hardest parts of my video and my workflow. And honestly, I would probably after that, turn it all the way to quarter resolution because at least in DaVinci Resolve, which is the program that I use to edit, turning that resolution down in what they call proxy mode doesn't actually create any proxies. It just brings the timeline resolution down to make it easier to play back. But there's no added workflow. Besides clicking that one button, I don't have to make proxies and like wait for that or you know generate optimized media or any of that kind of stuff. I just turn that down. So, so long as a computer can do all of this while just using that quarter resolution, that means to me it can at least edit my footage. Now the Razer Blade 14 could have played that back off as in like full resolution. So, uh, do I kind of wish this had a more powerful GPU in it? Yeah, a little bit, just to have that little extra headroom. Now, as far as battery life is concerned, I was editing a video earlier actually for an hour and I went from 100% to 35% in that hour. And then 20 minutes later was at 16% and about to get my low battery warning. And now as with all computers, when you start video editing or photo editing, etc., and the GPU starts to spin up and everything just starts to be a little more intense on the system, battery life is drastically changed, as you can see from this number compared to when we were just surfing the web earlier. And this is Three's Brewery. It's a local brewery that is essentially under my studio. So it's very convenient. It's also very bad for me. I've been coming here a lot lately because they keep doing these pop-up kitchens where it's like a different restaurant that comes in and serves the food from inside the brewery. And I just keep coming back and trying them all. Right now though, they have birria tacos, which roughly translates to mess tacos. They're basically a stewed meat thrown into a taco and usually served with that stew or consomme for you to dip them in. This is my second time having this type of taco and I kinda love them. Okay, now though, I wanna talk about the keyboard because it's great to type on and the keys have good travel and click to them, but they're not obnoxious or loud. The trackpad, I have to say, really impressed me more than I expected it to. The same sort of haptic feedback that they integrated into the new Slim Pen 2, they're using something similar for the trackpad. So essentially, the book or laptop, for example, had trackpads that actually clicked down mechanically, but only like the bottom half or so, basically. And this, on the other hand, actually uses tiny magnets all under the trackpad to produce vibrations where you press so that the trackpad doesn't actually move up and down like it used to, but it just kind of feels like it does. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's great. Now you can customize the level of vibration like the pen in settings. And again, just like the pen, I set it all the way up because it's not jarring and I kind of like it that way. That combined with the size and precision of the trackpad. And I can honestly say this is definitely the best trackpad I've ever used. Ports on the laptop are a bit limited, frankly. We only have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and a Surface Connect port, which is their proprietary like charging docking port on the right and two USB-C Thunderbolt 4 ports on the left. Now, yes, that's a little reminiscent of the new MacBooks with only two USB-C ports on them. And I do wish that there were more ports on it, even just more USB-C Thunderbolt 4 ports. But I will say that at least they are Thunderbolt 4, which I did an entire video on as to why that's a great connection type, which you can check out at the link below. But needless to say, it's fast, it's versatile. It also works with USB 4 and is backwards compatible with Thunderbolt and USB versions. So it can be used for a lot of things. And unlike the MacBook, which I also did a video on here, if you wanna check that out, one of these doesn't need to be used for power. So you can plug it into the outlet using the Surface Connect port and still have two ports instead of just one, which I guess is something. 
Above the screen, we have a new and improved Windows Hello camera that has a higher resolution IR sensor that helps it recognize your face better um, and lets you log into the computer. And I'll, I'll say I definitely notice an improvement, especially in challenging lighting like say this bar. Now paired with that is a 1080p webcam, thankfully, compared to the 720 on a lot of computers nowadays. And we also have studio mics as Microsoft calls them. So this is what that looks like and sounds like. And for software, this and the rest of the new Surface lineup are the first devices to ship with Windows 11 pre-installed. Now, I've been testing it in beta for quite a while now, and honestly, I really like it. It's not a big change, except for like UI and UX mostly, but that's something that Windows has desperately needed for a long time now. And I think that Microsoft actually did a great job with it. And here on a Surface device, which I feel like we all kind of agree does a really good job with hardware. The new update to the software helps the software at least better match that hardware now aesthetic. I have an appreciation for Surface devices, for sure. They're solid, their build quality is always great. They're actually kind of stylish without feeling like they copied someone. And they're just very good examples of well thought out engineering. And for all the talk of Panos Panay, the head of the Surface division, the idea of the device is appealing to more than just a spec sheet to help you stay in your flow and even invoking an emotional response. He's not wrong. And Surface devices, especially lately, are doing a better and better job of doing just that. You just want to use them. They feel Good. In fact, it's something that a lot of Apple users sometimes say about using their Macs. It's not about specs. It's about a feeling. There you go. My thoughts on the Microsoft Surface Laptop Studio. Curious what you guys think though. Let me know in the comments below. Really do appreciate hearing from you guys. Also, I'll leave a link below to the best price that I can find on a laptop as usual, as well as links to the places that I visited today. If you liked this video though, please thumbs up and share. It's greatly appreciated. Check out the channel. If you like what you see there, please subscribe and ding the bell next to the word subscribe so you can notify when I do new videos. As always though, regardless, thanks for watching.